Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's National Soil Survey Center webinar. My name is Sean McVeigh, National Training Coordinator for the Soil Science Division and host for today's webinar, Interpretations from Training to Application. This webinar is being recorded, and all participants join the webinar in listen-only mode. You receive the webinar audio through your device's speakers. There's no telephone dial-in. If you are having audio difficulty, please check the various ways on your computer speakers may be muted or have their volume set low including the speaker adjustments available in the Adobe Connect interface. You can maximize your webinar experience in Adobe Connect by shutting down VPNs and any other programs that might compete for bandwidth. This includes email and Microsoft Outlook and instant messaging and link. Please take a look at our webinar room layout. We have content pods that allow you to download uh, information, ask questions, of course and view the webinar presentation. Please use the four arrow icon in the feature presentation pod. That allows you to enter and exit the full screen view as you choose on your machine. To submit a comment or question for me or our presenters, use the Q&A pod and type in your question. We'll handle technical difficulties the best we can while hosting the webinar, interact with our presenters to answer your questions during verbal Q&A periods. I want to thank Bob Dobos, Acting National Leader for Interpretations, for being here to support our webinar and help answer any questions that may come up about interpretations and upcoming training. Bob, I'm going to turn the webinar over to you so you can introduce the topic and our presenters. Hello, uh, this is Bob Dobas, as Sean says, and thank you, Sean. Uh, today's webinar is Interpretations from Training to Application. Uh, this is a, a really interesting topic as well as uh, a really great example of the process of how an interpretation should be done and is, and is being done. Uh, starting out with a client that has a need or had a need uh, for finding places where this animal might live. You know, and it's tied pretty strongly to the soil and, and in particular soil properties and landscape properties and um, climatic properties that this animal needs. And so it's really, you know, geographically pretty well stuck where it is. And so the, and of course, you know, with the habitat being encroached on and being a large, slow-moving, good-tasting animal in an area of extreme poverty, it's pretty well endangered. And so we, the client got a hold of NRCS and other people, developed the criteria using the available science that we knew at the time. This was a couple, three years ago. And we developed an interpretation and tested it. And the people in Florida said, hey, wait a minute here. This doesn't quite work. And so and we got kind of stuck in the feedback loop there because Rick Robbins and the other folks, uh, Mike and, and the, in Florida, were finding that it just didn't work there for some reason. And so they've investigated this. And they're now going to show us what they found out. And so Rick and company down there, let's uh, let's have at it. Okay, thanks, Bob. Uh, this is going to be a, a two-part presentation. Michael and I are going to kind of tag team and, and go through these slides in each specific discipline's order. Um, first, a little background. Um, I attended the 2014 interpretation course at the uh, National Soil Survey Center indirect response to customer feedback on the existing regional interpretation on gopher tortoise habitat suitability. Upon completing the course, as so often I couldn't, you come back and you really want to apply it. Well, in this case, I could apply. I had the time that I could come back and, and apply what I had, been, had learned and had been trained to do. The portions of this webinar were presented at the multi-agency workshop in Conecuh National Forest in Alabama. Uh, the biologists and state soil scientists or a soil scientist from the state and federal agencies uh, throughout the southeast, from Louisiana to South Carolina, were present for the meeting. Our state partners are on this slide and have cooperated in this process. However, and I want to strongly emphasize this, it's a, it's a work in progress as this interpretation is not completed. And Georgia also has concerns about the accuracy of the interpretation and has recently acquired a 16,000 borough data set, XY data set, that they can use to intersect with Sergo. So the plan is to systematically tweak the interpretation further. Most of this interest is due to the possible federal listing as threatened throughout the Gopher Tortoises range. 
So the, this presentation will be two parts, one data mining and analysis, and the second interpretation and modification. Now Michael's going to talk about the status of the gopher tortoise. Thanks, Rick. Okay, so on this next slide, you're looking uh, at the status of the gopher tortoise and some of the key points. Um, first off, if you look at the map that's in the upper right-hand corner, that's uh, showing the, the current range of the uh, gopher tortoise. Uh, the red area, that's the western range, and it's uh, listed as threatened in that range. Um, it's split off at the Mobile and uh, Tom Bigby rivers, and the rest of the area is the green. That's where the uh, species is now a candidate for a listing. Um, it's being a candidate uh, as a threatened species, potentially, uh, somewhere maybe around 2020, uh, maybe the next time when they make a decision on that. So um, basically the tortoise populations have been declining uh, throughout its range and, and are still declining in many areas. Uh, we're still looking for data and, and that's part of the reason why we're doing this. So why the decline? Uh, it's mainly due to habitat destruction and uh, fragmentation. Uh, there's disease issues. And there's, there's a lot of issues with, uh, uh, what, you know, Bob said, human consumption. You know, it's still one thing that is overlooked. And, and also just the uh, vehicular impacts, you know, they're trying to cross the road from one habitat to another. Um, that's also an issue. So the uh, majority of the current habitat um, is, is on private lands. And, you know, that's one of, that's one of our main clients is private landowners. And, that's also where we can get the big, e biggest uh, ecological lift um, through NRCS and our programs. So that's that's really the key point to why I want to be involved in this is to make sure that you know our funding is, is going to the right places to benefit the species and you know accomplish the purpose of our initiative. Uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service also has uh, interest in this interpretation. Uh, they are identifying priority soils and suitable habitats. And, you know, eventually when they do a ruling, uh, the amount of suitable habitat is something that they're going to consider. And if, if a population is in an area that's currently deemed unsuitable, you know, maybe that population is uh, discounted and, and not included in, in the ruling somehow uh, as being just a, a fragmented population that, that can't survive. And I, I don't agree with that on, at this current time. So the gopher tortoise. We're looking at a uh, keystone species. Uh, that's a species that has a, a big role in, in, in providing some kind of a habitat value or some kind of a refuge for other species in the, in the ecosystem uh, that, that live with the gopher tortoise, similar to maybe like a, a beaver would be for some other areas. Um, they provide a burrow, and this burrow uh, is, is home to maybe 300, 400 species. And a lot of these species are, are listed, uh, endangered, threatened, or maybe soon will be, including the eastern indigo snake, uh, gopher frog, Florida mouse, uh, many others. So uh, I mentioned that, you know, this will play a big role, the, the interpretation and maybe how it's modified uh, with NRCS and our clients. Uh, there's two programs that stand out. Uh, one is the Longleaf Pond Initiative, and basically with that initiative is we're trying to restore uh, the forest of the southeast from long ago. And this is, this is probably the prime habitat for the gopher tortoise, especially in, in that um, range um, uh, in Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and, and at least the northern part of Florida. Uh, the other program is the Working Lands for Wildlife. And we work uh, in conjunction with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to try to preclude the, the need to list uh, species. And, and in this area, it's the gopher tortoise. So if, if we exclude a, a good portion of where the tortoises are for funding, obviously we can't provide cost share um, to, these, to these areas. Thanks, Michael. Uh, here's the current interpretation uh, rating for throughout the southeast, and the uh, magenta boundary is pretty much the gopher tortoise range. So you can see that the distribution of Florida, in particular, is is somewhat uh, is unsuited. But I'd also like to make special thanks to Sandy Page of Alabama and Bob Dobos for having the courage to uh, address this interpretation and try to make it available for the uh, 
for landowners and our partners. It was originally developed, as Michael said, in the western part of the range, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama, where it was federally listed, but later the interpretation was expanded throughout its range. Now on this interpretation, there are six rating classes from the red, which is highly suited, to blue, which is unsuited. As noted earlier, this interpretation is functioning well in the western range, but we don't want to touch it. We want to try to partition this interpretation so it doesn't affect the western range, but yet can address some of the issues we have here in the eastern range. And as you can see from this distribution of the interpretation, there is no range limitation requirement, so it runs all the way up into the mountains of, of, um, of Georgia. And it's up to the data stewards and the state soil scientists to decide which counties get this interpretation pushed to the web soil survey and to other, use, other, other programs. Rick, now, we have uh, a, Rick if I can inter interrupt here, we have a question, and okay. it, it uh, sort of relates to what you just said, and maybe you can just repeat that. But the question is, what are the concerns Georgia has with the interpretation? So can you go over just what, uh, I know you said the western region of this extent was, was okay with the interpretation, but uh, I don't know if you can break it out by state, what some of the issues with the interpretation were. I could address a little bit of the, of the uh, Georgia issues. Now, I can't address all of them. That would probably be Peterson in Athens would probably be better able to address that. But in the, um, the blue part of southeastern uh, Georgia, we were out there with, the, um, with our partners, and they were on poorly drained slow to salt as well. So they have an issue. Uh, in the southeast part of Georgia as well. Now, the other parts of it I can't really specifically address because I haven't started looking at it. D just acquired, like I said, the 16,000-acre data set with the boroughs on it. So once we get that intersected, and we can evaluate this a little closer. So anyway, does that, does, that, does that answer the question, I guess? Yeah, I think so. It was good. Okay. okay. Um, a little bit more background on this on the slide. Um, the focal area down in the southern part of the of the, uh, the peninsula was our target area based on some of our customer feedback. We had uh, Julie Morris from Wildlands Org and Tom Hocker from the University of Florida, who repeatedly were pestering us, I guess you would say, <laughs> but actually they were trying to bring up an issue, and that issue was they thought the soils were mismatched because there were literally thousands of tortoises on poorly drained spodosols and other taxonomic families in South Florida. All of these had water tables within 25 to 50 centimeters. So we conducted a field visit where we conducted soil site validations to make sure that the burrows were active, that they were tortoise burrows. That's what Michael was doing. Michael and Jody Smith were both from U.S. Fish and Wildlife as well as uh, wildlands orcs who we were documenting that they were actually were gopher tortoises burrows, and we were also documenting that they were um, poorly drained. And in most cases, they were. So just looking at the slide there, it's pretty obvious that that focal area is dead center in the middle of unsuited soils for gopher tortoise habitat. Michael? Thanks, Rick. Okay, the next slide we're looking at is the uh, national interpretation close up at the county level. And uh, this is looking at the uh, interpretation for the counties of uh, Charlotte, Hardy, and DeSoto within Florida. And if you look at it, you're, you're looking at black dots. Those black dots were confirmed active burrows on the ground. And we also looked at the soils. So wherever you see a red triangle, we looked at the soils and evaluated the soils to two meters. Um, like Rick said, our, our clients were, were concerned that the map wasn't correct, the soils were something different. Well, actually, the, the soil mapping turned out to be, to be pretty accurate, and, and it, it may have been slightly off, but it was still in the same drainage class and really close enough to, to, to not make that much of a difference. Um, so the, the maps, maps were correct. Um, the tortoises were maybe confused. They were in unsuitable habitat. <laughs> but uh, anyways, um, moving on. Uh, one of the shortcomings uh, of this data is that, you know, we have a lack of information from private lands. Um, so if you look at this map, uh, this is no means to represent the actual number of active burrows on the ground. 
Um, approximately 80% of potential gopher tortoise habitat uh, is believed to be on the private lands. And like I said, this is where we're lacking data. All right, so, you know, these dots are representing only a, a snapshot of the actual, actual tortoises out there. And uh, find the majority of the burrows are actually on that, that blue area, the unsuitable habitat. Okay, next slide. We're looking at a close-up example of the land uses and the ecosystem matrix um, of the area we're in. And the yellow dots, uh, those are the active burrows again, um, kind of clumped together in some areas and some others, they're uh, spread out a little bit. Uh, these areas contain uh, mostly poorly drained soils and these soils had a water table uh, roughly 30 centimeters um, for a seasonal high. And they were mixed in with, with freshwater ponds and some channelized waterways. And these drainage channels, they, they greatly affected the hydro periods of these sandy soils. Um, there were also some areas out there with slight rises uh, above the natural grade, maybe 12 to 80, 18 inches. And these areas provide a, a critical area for burrowing sites uh, during the wettest part of the year for the tortoise. A key fact to remember, um, looking at this data and, and thinking about gopher tortoises and their habitat, is that they have several burrows that they use throughout the year and you know basically it depends on the amount of rainfall, uh, available forage, uh, seasonal temperature changes and they also you know just for social interactions will we'll move from burrow to burrow. I looked at some data from Central Florida and some studies and these numbers were higher than I thought and these are probably the extreme but you know they found that males were using an average of 17 burrows and females were using an average of nine burrows in their study area. So, you know, they're moving around from burrow to burrow, um, depending on those factors I mentioned earlier. So, uh, basically, if you're looking at this, you got to remember that, you know, one burrow may not be um, suitable at one time of year, but there's other available options. All right, the next slide. We're looking at some pictures of the habitat of where we were conducting the field work. And the ecological communities you're looking at are, are dry prairie, uh, mesic flatwoods, hydric flatwoods. If you look at the two photos on the left, uh, you'll notice that you'll see, you may see uh, burrows at the bottom of those photos. This gives you an idea of, you know, what the burrows look like on this landscape. Take a look at this uh, landscape. You'll see that there's very little topographic relief. Uh, there's a bunch of unmapped uh, micro highs or lows. Uh, scattered throughout this landscape and um, it's kind of like the surface of an orange peel you know it looks smooth from a distance but up close there's there's some minor bumps and, and valleys that really make a difference in terms of the water table out there uh, all these areas were mapped as poorly drained photosols um, but once again the, the micro topography plays an important role uh, in making this suitable habitat for the gopher tortoise Next slide, basically looking at two different types of burrows. Uh, it's intended to, you know, compare burrows from different soil drainage classes. And the top two photos are from excessively drained soils, and the bottom two are poorly drained soils. One notice, uh, one difference you got to look at here is the angle of entry and the amount of uh, apron material. So at the excessively drained soils, uh, the tortoise uh, is is basically taking a deeper angle with the uh, digging of the burrow this is to maintain the stability of the uh, tunnel. Um, if they were to dig at a shallow angle, uh, that, that burrow would cave in. So they're, they're going down a little bit uh, sharper at an angle as opposed to the uh, more poorly drained soils. They're also going deeper. They're trying to get down to the water table and that's where the microclimate uh, is going to be and that's where they can you know, have an area for uh, thermal regulation. They are cold blooded and they have to find a way to cool off and or warm up. So that's a, that's a critical thing to remember is they're, they're getting down to the water table. And down in South Florida it's, it's, it's a little bit higher, um, closer to the surface so that the burrows are not as deep and they don't need to be as deep.
you want to learn a little bit more about um, the biology of the tortoise, uh, the Forest Service has a good publication out. You just Google it or internet search uh, Forest Service gopher tortoise. Uh, that's, a, that's a really good article that explains all the biology and the ecology of, of the tortoise. Okay, so this next slide we're going to zoom back out and look at the entire state of Florida and we're going to examine the distribution of the gopher tortoise um, based upon the data set that we have. Uh, important to note that the data you're looking at is uh, primarily from public lands and that explains why it's distributed the way it is. Uh, it's kind of clumped together in certain areas and that's where these, these public lands were where the data is collected for the most part. Um, burrows are extensively located in central and south Florida on these blue colored areas which again those blue colored areas are unsuitable habitat according to the interpretation. We start out using a 200 burrows uh, data set from our clients and we worked our way up to 20,000 data points uh, with help through uh, Florida Natural Areas Inventory, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, and uh, Fish and Wildlife Commission. And like Rick said, he just received uh, 16,000 more data points for Georgia and we're going to take a look at those in the future. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the differences uh, in terms of the climate and the landscape. Rick, go ahead and talk about this slide. Okay, thanks, Michael. So we received those 20,000 data points from all of our agencies and partners, and our next step was to start analyzing it. And we could analyze it a bunch of different ways, but really from what we had seen from the interpretation, it was wetness was really restricting most of the suitability. So we wanted to define these by drainage classes and initially we looked at it statewide. Um, and as you can see, if you look at this statewide, it's excessively drained and poorly drained are pretty evenly represented. But this is misleading. At the regional meeting, we presented the distribution differences on temperature regime and we'll see this a little later. In addition, on this data, it's important to remember several different key, key factors. One is the data, like Michael said, the data collection was restricted only to public land, with a few exceptions in South Florida, which were on private parcel. Uh, the data collection was not systematic, nor was it spatially well distributed. And generally speaking, from a soil geomorphic standpoint, they're distinctly different between the panhandle and the peninsula and those soils and geomorphic settings were not field verified. These were just data points that we clipped in our GIS and analyzed. So minor differences in elevation and things like that were not considered. It was strictly uh, where that point intersected the Surigo data. And also the above ground ecological condition was not known or wasn't verified. So we don't know how suitable the, the above ground habitat was to go for tortoise, um, for the gopher tortoise themselves. And also the data collection was, was kind of biased it, because when they were running out, going out and running transects, they were going to where they thought the gopher tortoise should, would be. So we really don't have a good, really solid uh, data set that says, because they didn't go out and survey poorly drained soils because they're considered unsuited. So, but regardless of all these, quote, limitations, um, the data set represents the best evidence we have on the tortoise preferences. I just want to follow up on that with, with this next slide and, and take a look at the differences and, and you know, look at the panhandle and, and the northern range of the tortoise compared to what we're seeing in the South Florida. Generally speaking, the panhandle, the soils are, are better drained, uh, classified as loamy alpha-soils. Um, the, the land formations have more relief and elevation change in the panhandle in the northern range of the, of the tortoise. Uh, climate is colder during the winter and for longer periods. In this portion of the range, you know, the interpretation appears to be working very well. Um, the, the climate is much wetter during the coldest time of year. So these tortoises need a deep burrow moderates the climate, um, creates a microclimate, 
but it also has to be one that will stay dry uh, for weeks or months of inactivity during the winter. Uh, and well-drained soils fit this requirement very well. You know, shallow burrows in this area would, would, would be either flooded or they wouldn't be deep enough to provide that, that temperature that the tortoise would like um, to, to maintain the, the, their body temperature. So, you know, looking at peninsular Florida, um, the soils are wet, classified mainly as uh, sandy photosols, and it's, it's flat out there. Um, but the winter in central and south Florida is, is a lot more moderate and only have, you know, brief spells of cold weather that last a few days at a time. This also happens to be the, uh, the time of year when, when it's driest out there, so the, the water tables are at their lowest. So, you know, burrows aren't flooded when the cold protection is necessary. Uh -huh. Gopher tortoise in general, the burrow, where they can have uh, thermal regulation. Um, also, they need to have the forage. So that's where these soils with better organic material and better water holding capacity, you know, basically it's the best of both worlds down in South Florida. All right, this next slide, uh, looking at the temperature regime uh, break between the thermic and hyperthermic uh, regions. Um, the green dots represent the burrows on, on poorly or very poorly drained soils. And south of the, uh, the, the line you're looking at, the red line, 90% of these burrows were on poorly or very poorly drained soils. And as I mentioned earlier, we think this is mainly due to the less severe temperature variations in South Florida and, you know, the climate changes with in terms of the, the rainfall being a lot drier during the cold period. Uh, south of this line, the burrow depths can be shallower. And that's all the tourist really needs to, is, is a shallow burrow. Sometimes they even may hide under some leaf beds just to, you know, get out of the sun. You know, these are real shallow burrows and essentially the climate is, is the factor that makes that different. And that's that hyperthermic line, we believe. So, you know, we, we, Rick and I have been talking about this. And are, are poorly drained soils, are they suitable above the line? Well, probably to a limited extent. But, you know, more so south of the line is where they, where they come into play. OK, thanks, Michael. Um, so what we did was we broke it down into the two temperature regimes to look at what the distribution was by drainage class. And as you can see from the, the graph, out of the 6,670 boroughs, uh, roughly half of those were on excessively drained soil. And also moderately well-drained soils were, were very well represented. Now the caveat is that somewhat excessively drained soils are very rare in Florida, and in the panhandle, the well-drained soils are typically used for agriculture or weren't in public land. So the thermic is the blue, and the hyperthermic is the yellow. Now for the hyperthermic temperature regime borough distribution, there's complete, well not a complete, but a significant shift in their use of borough, or use of drainage class. The burrows are dominantly on poorly drained soils, about 45%, and fairly evenly distributed on the better drained soils. The total use of wetter soils is similar to all the other drainage classes combined. However, better drained soils in the hyperthermic region are limited in extent, and they're usually associated with the central Florida ridge, which runs down the spine of the state. This is temperature really the only factor affecting their, their preference for poorly drained soils? No. It can be a combination of factors, this and this we don't know yet, but we do know that the dominance of wetter soils that have a mosaic of unmappable micro highs and micro lows, regional geomorphology and the relationship between the soils, the species adaptability, and anthropogenic altercations of the landscape, whether it be through channelization of waterways or bedding of pine, pinelands, those sort of things can, can increase gopher tortoise habitat, or suitability anyways. But the climate is less severe, 
and the seasonality of the precipitation is wet during the summers and dry during the winters when they need some some burrowing uh, thermal regulation to keep keep warm during the colder months, they don't have to go too deep. So this is just a data comparison of the, of the three different uh, graphs that I showed you so that you can have it all at once, all in one, all on one screen. And the top one is the statewide distribution by drainage class, and then the thermic and hyperthermic regimes on the left, thermic, right, hyperthermic. Remember, roughly twice the number of the borough locations are in the hyperthermic. So we had 13,000 borough locations in the hyperthermic versus the thermic. So the data in that respect is kind of skewed. And so it's going from the red is the excessively drained all the way down to blue, which is poorly and very poorly. Note, though, that the overall preference is similar in both regions, with the exception of the extreme, the poorly and the excessively drained, which are flip-flop between the two regions. So that really didn't, we felt like, didn't portray a really accurate uh, reflection of their preferences and their distributions. So what we attempted to do from that standpoint was, since it was all from public land, and it nearly doubled the burrows in the hyperthermic regime, we wanted to de-emphasize these factors and other factors, and we wanted to just obtain a relative preference of gopher tortoise preferences by drainage class. And so by doing that in ArcGIS, we intersected Surgo to the borough locations and clipped it on the Florida managed lands. That way we had a actual extent of the drainage class on the data that we had. And this data kind of, this analysis kind of uh, surprised the results, we thought. Uh, the moderately well-drained soils that have a seasonal high water table between 76 and 122 centimeters are as preferred as the excessively drained soils in the thermic region. The somewhat poorly drained and moderately well-drained soils are preferred more in the hyperthermic region. And we believe that the reduction of the somewhat poorly drained soils in the thermic region is due to the interplay between cold, cold weather, and the shallow seasonal, shallow seasonal high water table. But it is, a, the most important thing is to notice the relationship between the poorly drained soils in the thermic, which is like 0.04, and in the hyperthermic, 0.33. So there is a definite preference in the hyperthermic region. And that's due to the freezes being rare and the precipitation patterns, wet in the summer, dry in the winter. So that brings us, now that we've crunched the numbers, uh, that brought us to the point, well, let's look at this interpretation that's national or slash regional with the gopher tortoise habitat suitability. So we want to see if we need, what kind of modifications we could make to address the sub-rural deficiencies and how to retain the interpretation where it is functioning correctly. So this is the, uh, the interpretation for the gopher tortoise suitability. It's you know, the rule and all the sub-rules. Now, from what we could tell, best we could tell, the only ones that we really needed to look at in depth was the depth to the restrictive layer and also the depth to the seasonal high water table. And we want to explore the diggability, and now with the addition of the um, Georgia data set, we can also look at diggability and see if that's functioning correctly throughout its range. The de depth of restricted layer really is functioning correctly because it's running off of the hardness and the component restriction. But our only recommendation on this would be to change spodic horizons, which are not restrictive, and replace that with Ortstein, which is cemented spodic horizon. But otherwise, it appears to be functioning correctly. But we can further evaluate that with, the, with all these da additional data sets. So this, was, this is the sub-rule that is most responsible for the interpretation not functioning correctly in South Florida, the water table. I'll briefly discuss subrules, the evaluations, rating classes, and then illustrate the spatial representation 
of the changes that we were recommending for at least South Florida. I think I put the wrong slide. So then we were So how does the Florida specific water table? I just did this. Okay, so here is the national rule sub sub rule for the water table, and it's running off of a seasonal high water table top of 50 centimeters to 200 centimeters. If it's less than 50 centimeters, it's absolutely not suited. And we believe that for at least South Florida and possibly southeast, southeast Georgia, that this rule needs to be modified or we have to figure out a way to isolate it and retain it in areas where it's functioning correctly. So we developed a Florida sub rule that would hopefully work for Peninsula Florida and possibly Southeast Georgia and we're also in the process of developing a, a new MLRA sub rule in order to partition the western range and perhaps most of uh, the upper coastal plain and uh, keep it as it's functioning now. So what does it look like in South Florida from a soil geomorphology standpoint? According to the Fish and Wildlife Service, Florida has the largest population of tortoises throughout its range. And in spite of this population, soils rated as well suited are relatively rare in peninsular Florida. Even the excessively drained sandy soils are only ranked as moderately well, which would be your Ash Tula, St. Lucie, and Paola on this diagram. But more importantly, many of the unsuited soils, the satellite, the Immokalee, and the Mayaka are routinely used by gopher tortoises for their burrowing. And most important, one of the most important things too is the marginal soils of pomelo is actually in South Florida is a preferred soil for gopher tortoise. So to revisit this, uh, if we modify the water table to 25 centimeters and run it from 25 to 200 centimeters, then we may be able to get some results that would reflect what the gopher tortoises are telling us in South Florida. But how does this do, how does this compare to the national interpretation? Well, I'm only dealing here with the wetter end of the spectrum on the soils in South Florida because that's why they're impacted the most. And the scrubby flatwoods is a preferred ecosystem for the, um, for the gopher tortoise in South Florida. And this water tables are ranged in 24 inches down to 18 inches. And currently, if you look at the interpretation, national is on the top or is on the bottom. It's coming out as marginal, but if we tweak it with our 25 centimeter rule, it, it, we can bring it up to less suited, and we can move the somewhat poorly drained satellite soil and the poorly drained Mayaka soil up one drainage class and at least make them marginal, which would be better than unsuited. So this, these two evaluations, one on the top is the national interpretation, and the one on the, on the lower is our Florida interpretation, and we adjusted it. The national interpretation starts at 50 centimeters and runs up to 200, but based on what we've seen in South Florida, we are tweaking it to a 0 0.1 at 25 centimeters and topping it out at 76 centimeters, which is the, sum, the somewhat poorly drained and moderately well-drained soil. So you're actually, we're actually increasing the rating class in South Florida to, to capture one of their preferred soils and environment. So again, here's the, here's the interpretation results for gopher tortoises, the national, you saw before. And if we apply the rating results that I showed you on the previous slide, notice well, first of all, notice the how the, the bodies, the wetter soils, the, the drainage, seat, drainage systems, the, the uh, freshwater ponds, notice how they are better illustrated. But more importantly, notice the, the 
notice the uh, gopher tortoise locations and their um, suitability, which is marginal to less suited. So what we've actually done is, is tried to, to illustrate and capture in this interpretation what the gopher tortoises are telling. So if we apply this throughout the state, the one on the left is the national or regional, and the one on the right is the Florida subrule. But this, I don't think this is going to, this is going to work because we have to recognize that we want to, first of all, partition and maintain the existing interpretation where it's working, but we also need to determine how this is impacting Georgia and uh, some of that eastern, extreme eastern rain. So what we're, we're planning on doing is adding an MLRA subrule that will allow us to partition this data, maintain it where it's working, tweak it where it's not, and our, the MLRAs that we're going to be working with specifically are the peninsular ones and the ones that run up in the southeast Georgia, which would be 152A, 153, 154, 155, and 156A and B. Currently, we're working with Georgia in order to try to get this um, rectified. So since we wanted to try to partition the interpretation, we're working on an MLRA subrule and evaluation and property for the region to exclude regions outside the range. So, so everything in grain would come back as zero. Everything is, that's it, or in gray would come back as zero. The green would retain the existing interpretation. The yellow would have minor modifications to the subrules, but we'd have more significant ones with the peninsula of Florida. And the way we're, tr we're going to try to use this is at the component level and, and then go to the map unit overlap table and use the map unit overlap table to try to separate these specific areas. So further refinements. Like I said earlier, we want to try to evaluate the diggability index. I, would, I, really, want to, I really want to look at that one. That's, that was one I, I'm wondering, you know, Yes, is it working pretty well? Yes, but can we tweak it and make it a little bit better? We, with uh, roughly 36,000 borough locations, I think that we probably can. We also want to explore changing the rating classes for suitability, because right now, like I said earlier, it's it, Ashitula, which is one of the sand hill soils that's excessively drained, deep sands, preferred go for tortoise habitat, currently coming back is, is only moderately suited, when in fact it's, it's really probably a highly suited soil. We also want to consider, since this is a gopher tortoise, quote, habitat suitability, we might want to consider a productivity subrule for biomass or forage generation. And an important thing right here is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Florida Fish and, Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. They identify priority soils. We do not want to impact significantly what, what, the, what their relocation and mitigation uh, rules are. But we do need to work together with them, try to come up with something that's um, agreeable to everybody, but also to accurately uh, reflect what the gopher tortoise is telling us with these 36,000 borough data sets. So in con and in conclusion, um, we're going to once we get the this interpretation final and and everybody buys off on it, uh, then we will provide an addendum to the Fish and Wildlife publication based on actual data, and hopefully we'll better uh, capture what the gopher tortoise's habitat requirements are. That's it, Sean. All right, excellent. This time, I give people online a chance to enter their questions into the Q&A pod, and we'll take those. In the meantime, I'll open it up to those in the room with me. Are there any questions? No, not really. Bob's going to come up and uh, talk closer to the phone here.
Yeah, Rick, this is one of the really uh, interesting situations or where you actually have performance data to corroborate the, your interpretive output, isn't it? That's because correct. you can see where there's burrows and where there aren't burrows, and the, you know, probably the density of the burrows might have some significance also. So this is really cool. Well, here's here's one of the limitations, in my opinion, Bob, is when, when we were out there, they were all mapped poorly drained soils. Mm -hmm. But there were micro highs, micro, like I said earlier, micro lows, plus there they were on areas that were actually kind of, they were so poorly damaged, but they were sh slightly shedding water. You, if you look, there would be a, a slight right. a slight slope break towards a drainage system. But that's mapped all the same. And there's no way to get, I don't think there's any way to get around that with our current, um, current with the yeah. mapping scale and the mapping. So. Yeah, this is one where we really need to have a raster-based interpretation interpretation with some LIDAR kind of data underneath it, huh? Well, and we've been talking with UF on that, and they're, they're trying to, but see, that's part of the problem. Florida doesn't have a complete set of LIDAR data, to my knowledge, anyways. Uh-huh. Yeah, and it's, uh, you know, even a little hump makes a big difference. You know, I worked in Virginia. When you walked up, you know, a you know six-inch hill, the water table might go down a foot. Right, and in these highly porous, highly permeable sands, uh, these water tables are highly dynamic. I mean, right. and just because that water table says it's at 25, 30 centimeters in, in NASA's doesn't mean that means only that that's the highest point you get at any day, any month of any year. So. Um, and how long does it go for Taurus? How, how often or how long can he be out um, and, and exit that burrow? In fact, there's been documentation of them in flooded burrows with just their nose sticking out of them. Uh huh. I didn't realize they traveled quite so much too. That's that's pretty interesting. They they can go from burrow to burrow. You know, and they might have seven homes. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, and a lot of those would be, you know. Not unlike humans, we got summer homes and winter homes. You know, we're fortunate <laughs> enough, but you know, they go to where the forage is best and where they can thermoregulate, and and there's some social interactions that play into that too. They just go out and you know, either the mating or you know, males and males um, kind of battle over some territory. There's a lot of moving around going on, and they don't mind to share it with other animals as well. You know, as being a keystone species. Yeah. Any questions on there yet, Sean? No questions, but I want to remind people that we do have the NASA's Designing and Developing Soil Interpretations training coming up in the middle of September. I think it's September 15th, 16th, and 17th Okay. here in Lincoln, Nebraska. And so if you're inclined to be working on interpretations, not just on gopher tortoise habitat, but others, and want to learn how to customize those, uh, that's the course for you. So go into AgLearn, enroll that, and really kind of run it as a workshop here in Lincoln. Yeah, we try to get a, you know, learn a lot of stuff doing it. I highly recommend it. it was a great we have class. a question online. Would it not be safer for soil survey for this interp focus on soil limitations for gopher tortoise habitat rather than gopher tortoise? Oh boy, there's a, a wording issue in here. Takes more than soil to provide habitat, too. I guess is, is the upshot. Yes. I think. Well, go ahead, Rick. You know, I have an opinion go ahead, on Bob. this. Focus but, on soil limitations rather than soil habitat. I guess. What we're looking at here is a direct request from a client, and they wanted the suitability, so that's what we gave them. Is, is that about right, Rick? Is, that know, is absolutely correct. Is there any data on soil temperature and site activity? Not much, and no. And, and you know, I looked into I looked into like C factors, R factors, um, temperature, mean annual air temperature. But with now with SDJR, where they're merging all these map units and the temperature regimes are not as county specific, then it, it, it's it's more difficult. Uh, so. I looked around and I played around with stuff for quite a while trying to figure out what's the best way. And finally, I just came in and said, well, that, at least the MLRA has 
a defined boundary. And the, and the other thing is, is I ran the climate data and I just portrayed it or displayed it in ARG across the whole region. And unless that stuff is populated correctly, you're going to get all kinds of just different um, I don't know. different results. At least that's my that was my findings from from using the available data from NASA. Got another uh, couple of questions here. One of them is, I am a soil scientist and authorized agent and literally use SHS to estimate if I am near the bottom of burrows. I have also taught many young biologists to use SHS. Right. And for and those listening, what, what is high SHS? Sat seasonal high saturation in Florida in these low carbon porous sandy soil that re re retain redox morphic features is, is tough. It's very, it's very d difficult to see stripping or any of your other indicators in some cases. Right. Yeah, if there's nothing to reduce, it's hard to have oxidation. Right. The carbon burns up so fast down here, and it's so mobile. Mm -hmm. Another question on the evaluation, Rick. So. What is the rationale in the evaluation going from linear to arbitrary linear and going from 0 to 0 0.1 and 0 0.1 to 200 plus and not using the linear and reduce the range? Well, I, that, that's a good question. I could do that. But I, I was I, like, well, okay, I'm on detail of the at quality assurance for MO, and I haven't been able to completely work with this as much as I'd wanted to, but this one gave me some results that I felt were good. Yes, I could probably do that, but I haven't had time to really apply it. To be true. Getting to a fundamental uh, level on this, Rick, is that's really the power of the fuzzy system, is that the, the evaluations are based on data or hunches or hypotheses or anything that you can think of to base them on that that seems to work and and uh, we do a lot of things that you know you do it simply because it seems to work and you and don't you necessarily don't. <laughs> you don't necessarily have to have a reason why other than it works if it works that's true yeah, and that's why I played around with that a long time and I said well this is giving me pretty good results and so then like you said it's then I'm not going to try to reinvent the wheel if something's working that's a feature of the fuzzy logic system. And, you know, a lot of it is intuitive and hunches, and that makes it fun to use and god awful hard to teach. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and and it, and if you get the results and the results are consistent, then I think you're good. And, and there will be a time where you'll be able to say why that is reacting as it is. But right now, we would might not be there yet. Well, and that's why with the more data we've got and the more analysis we can do, we can refine it, the better we can explore how to best portray it. So there's a comment online, let the data lead to the conclusion. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, there's another question here that deals with, uh, I guess, sensitivity is uh, providing too much information. But uh, should we be leery to publish these kind of results in WebSol survey if it was a direct request, especially dealing with species that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife can limit private land use on? Uh, suitabilities identify habitat and limitations leave habitat determination to specialists. It's a touchy subject, maybe. What do you? Any thoughts on that? We definitely should protect the information of private landowners, especially in association with the possible listing and potential uh, regulation in the future, yes. I think what you have here is an opportunity for some, you know, to kind of train the state soil scientists. Um, I'm not, yeah, I, I agree. I'm not necessarily sure you'd want to export this interpretation of the data to the uh, web soil survey. Well, you can, can't you get it there now? You just can't display it, display it thematically, is that correct? I'm not sure. That that could very well be true. I just don't think you can go do a thematic map. Uh, this is this another follow-up comment that uh, this was one of the main beef of biologists with the old-style uh, wildlife interps. 
we're going to give away too much information on the habitat location. Uh huh. Yeah. I know, and it, it's true in the Northeast as well. You know, it's, here's where you go find all the rare orchids. Right. Yeah, and you can dig them up. Find where to dig them up. <laughs> Yeah, there are some places, some instances where the interpretive data might might should be proprietary or protected anyway. I definitely agree with that. Um, one of the issues I had, this is Michael, you know, we were working with the service and they wanted five levels of, of suitability or, you know, break it up from unsuited all the way up to highly suitable. I mean, at some point, the landscape can, can produce suitable burrows and then you know I was trying to push for more of a secondary level of okay this works for burrows but let's look at the management and what's the habitat look like before we start rating it higher or lower or marginal and those kind of things to me are more in, the, in how the land is being um, disturbed through fire through, through brush management um, prescribed grades whatever we're doing out there to me I, I'd like to you know somehow capture, you know, the landscape in terms of the forage available, uh, you know, how much canopy cover, those kind of things are a lot more important, I believe, for the productivity of the, of the species and, and producing, you know, the young. Right. Yeah. You can't just go on soils. That, that's, I'm glad we had the interpretation to start with, but I think, you know, somehow in the future, we, Rick mentioned maybe the productivity of the soils we start looking at, you know, Water holding capacity and, and fertility. fertility, and see what see where we can go with that potentially. There's a, you know a, an interpretation out there called uh, primary productivity that really comes in pretty well with the gopher tortoise because they live on some pretty unproductive sites. They do, and one of the things that came up in our discussion in Kaneka was. Those were somewhat higher priority because those were the sites that would be last to be uh, overcome by vegetation because of the productivity issue. So that with lack of management, those would be the last sites where tortoises potentially could go without being shaded out. So we had some issues there where we, we discussed with the folks in the room and, and it came in to be, well, we think those sites, those real unproductive soils may be a refuge because people aren't managing like they used to or because of other reasons in terms of regulations and, and burning or what have you. So we fought with that issue too and we're still discussing on, you know, where to take it from here. Well, I, I from my standpoint, I agree with Michael 100%. I have tortoises on my farm and in the open part of the grove, I think I've got like nine burrows. You go into the wooded areas, there's none. But as soon as there's a little clearing or something, and there's some forage, there's a burrow. So there's a strong, really strong correlation there. And there are also those unprotected, you know, white sandy soils. Those are the easiest ones to see. So I think it's more of a, you know, currents by by how many you see. You think that maybe that's um, where they're most common, and that's where the burrows surveys occur. You know, where they think they are. So there's some bias there in terms of the public lands. They don't survey their whole properties. They generally survey, you know, moderately to excessively drained soils. So even the poorly drained soils on some properties aren't surveyed um, completely. Well, One Rick more and question. Michael, I, I just wanted to thank you for your time and effort to make this presentation today, and thanks to all the participants for joining in. We had more than 60 people on today's webinar, and the on-demand recording of this webinar will be available.